Our first speaker is Dr. Laura Kahn, and she's a physician and a research scholar with the program on science and global security at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. So in April of 2006, so this is um, quite a few years back, she published Confronting Zoonoses, Linking Human and Veterinary Medicine in the in the, Center for, for, in the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC's Journal of Emerging Infectious Diseases. So that publication is what helped launch the One Health Initiative. So, uh, so um, this is pretty, uh, it was very key time in uh, our development of One Health and, and starting to implement One Health. Um, and so this One Health Initiative, if you remember, is, was one of the three groups that started the One Health Day. Um, that group is made up of private individuals, and they consist of veterinarians, they consist of uh, public health professionals, um, MDs, um, biologists, uh, epidemiologists. So there's a huge diversity of people that are just private individuals that joined together, created this group, and now they, they really work hard to educate and to disseminate information about One Health and using the One Health approach. So, um, so yes, that publication, Confronting Zoonoses, Linking Human and Veterinary Medicine, is what helped the One Health, launch the One Health Initiative. And as I said, that initiative seeks to improve the health of all species by increasing communication and collaboration between human, animal, and environmental health specialists. So it's really uh, education, communication is the, uh, is the main focus. So Dr. Khan is the author of Who's in Charge? Leadership During Epidemics, Bioterror Attacks, and Other Public Health Crises. Um, that was published in 2009 by Prager Security International, if you're interested in looking, up, looking that up. She writes online columns for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and has published in many peer-reviewed journals. So her second book, One Health and the Politics of Antimicrobial Resistance, was published in June of 2016. And that one was published by John Hopkins University Press. Princeton University awarded her course, Hogs, Bats, and Ebola, an introduction to One Health policy with a 250th anniversary fund for innovation in undergraduate education. That sounds like a pretty cool, um, a pretty cool course to take as an undergrad. Dr. Khan is a native of California, and she holds a BS degree in nursing from UCLA and an MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She also holds a master's degree in public health from Columbia University and a master's degree in public policy from Princeton University. Dr. Khan is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and is a recipient of the New Jersey Chapters Laureate Award. In 2014, she received a Presidential Award for Meritus Service from the American Association of Public Health Physicians, and in 2016, the American Veterinary Epidemiology Society awarded her with their highest honor for her work in One Health. And that award was the K.F. Meyer James H. Steele Goldhead Kane Award. Hello, I'm Laura Kahn. I'm co-founder of the One Health Initiative, and I'd like to thank the organizers at the University of Tennessee for inviting me to speak to you on One Health Day. I'm gonna talk with you, give you a One Health perspective on food security, emerging zoonotic diseases, and antimicrobial resistance. 
One Health is the concept that human, animal, and environmental or ecosystem health are linked. This concept provides a useful framework for examining and addressing issues such as food security, emerging zoonotic diseases, and antimicrobial resistance. Our website, the onehealthinitiative.com, has been a uh, repository for all news and information pertaining to One Health since 2008. Please visit it, tell your friends and family to visit it. It's a labor of love for us and we like to get as much traffic there as possible. So first I'd like to talk about food security. What is food security? Well, basically it means no hungry people. In 1996 at the World Food Summit, they defined food security as existing when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And it's built on three pillars, food availability, food access and food use. <clears throat> Food security is so important that the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals listed it as their number two goal, zero hunger, which also means food security. In 1948, the United Nations declared food to be a human right, but it did not define what type of food. And the question we must ask today in the 21st century is should a meat rich diet be a human right? And if so, what type of meat? Should that include domesticated animals, wild animals, or both? We in the United States eat more meat per capita than any other country on the planet. This data from the Food and Agriculture Organization shows that the United States has been a very high meat consumer, although it's been dropping. Countries such as China, has had a dramatically increase in meat consumption per, per uh, capita. Wild animals, the consumption of wild animals is very popular in some countries. These include bats, civet cats, pangolins. Of course, there's a danger of zoonotic transmission. Uh, SARS from China in 2003, MERS emerging from Saudi Arabia in 2012, most recently COVID-19 from China. The question we must ask is what's next? There are many zoonotic threats. About 60% of all human pathogens are zoonotic, meaning diseases of animals that can infect humans. About 75% of the newly emerging zoonotic diseases are zoonotic and most agents of bioterrorism are zoonotic. And these zoonotic diseases can emerge from anywhere in the world. So the question we must ask is, should wildlife trade and live animal markets be banned to stop further zoonotic spillover events? To answer that question, we should do a comparison between China and India, since both countries do have live animal markets. To compare, both countries, China and India, have over 1 billion people. They both have issues with sanitation and hygiene. They're major users of antibiotics and have severe problems with antimicrobial resistance. China has a tradition of eating wild exotic animals and using them in traditional Chinese medicines. In contrast, in India, 80% of the people there are Hindu and 40% are vegetarian. India has the largest fraction of vegetarians of any other country. Now, India has, certainly has its share of infectious disease problems, and it has some of the most resistant bacteria in the world to antibiotics, but it is not having the coronavirus spillover events the way China has. China's been having not only coronavirus spillover events, but avian influenza spillover events as well. But reducing the demand for endangered exotic animals is not easy. It's a very strong cultural preference, particularly in China. 
and bans can lead to illegal markets. There are pros and cons to eating meat. Meat provides important micronutrients such as vitamin B12 and iron. And indeed there's evidence that we evolved into modern humans because we hunted, cooked and ate meat. Eating meat is an integral part of many cultures and religions. But there are cons. Meat is not essential if you can supplement your diet with vitamin B12 and other important vitamins and minerals. Raising domesticated animals contaminates environments with fecal waste. Hunting wildlife disrupts biodiversity and can destroy ecosystems. And as I mentioned, it can increase zoonotic uh, spillover risks. So now I'm going to talk about emerging zoonotic diseases because many of these diseases are emerging either directly or indirectly from society's demand for meat and other animal proteins. So in other words, emerging zoonotic diseases are linked with food security. As I had mentioned, about 75% of emerging zoonotic diseases are zoonotic. Some of the more common animals associated with these diseases include bats, and they can harbor SARS, Nipah virus, Ebola virus most likely, rabies, Hendra, and SARS-CoV-2 most recently. Rodents uh, can carry leptospirosis, hantavirus, plague, rat bite fever, South American arena viruses among others, and monkeys can harbor viruses such as the Circopithecine herpes virus one, also known as the B virus, monkeypox, simian immunodeficiency virus, TB, and it's a yellow fever host. So these zoonotic diseases, diseases that can spread to people, include viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, and prions, but I'm going to focus on viruses. Viruses are technically not alive. They have a protein coat. They have spikes uh, on their surfaces. They do not eat or eliminate, they cannot reproduce the, on them, they cannot reproduce by themselves. They are technically parasites. And this is an image of rabies here, these bullet-shaped viruses. This is the uh, classic image of the Ebola virus, and this is the image of the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Now, how do these spillover events occur? Well, these spikes on the surface of the virus uh, coat can be thought of as keys. They are keys that are stick up. Uh, and the keys, the goal of the key is to find a lock that's on the surface of a cell to which they can fit in. RNA viruses such as coronaviruses and influenza viruses are known for rather sloppy replication and so frequent mutations occur. Influenza, in fact, is one of the most sloppy viruses out there. It's got an eight-segmented virion, eight-segmented uh, uh, viral genetic material, uh, which is why we often have to get new flu shots each year because the virus is always changing. But it's, as I said, the mutations that can lead to um, these spillover events. So once the virus's protein spike fits in well into the lock of the, on the surface of the host cell, it can then attach and insert its genetic material into the cell and then turn the cell into a virus making machine. The virus particles reassemble and then burst out of the cell enabling these new virus particles to go and infect new cells and the process continues. Um, so how are these dis uh, diseases emerging? Well, increasing global population pressures. There's now almost 8 billion of us on the planet. Uh, we all need to eat. 
Um, and so these practices involving widespread deforestation lead to environmental destruction, intensive agriculture to feed everybody, bush meat or wild animal consumption, global trade and travel, which allows these microbes to spread, and very likely climate change as well. The concern about the emergence of a new coronavirus uh, from China has been known for a very long time. And in fact, in this issue of clinical microbiology reviews in 2007, concluded that the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-like viruses in horseshoe bats, together with the culture of, ex of eating exotic mammals in China is a time bomb. And indeed, now uh, that we are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, there's over 44 million global cases as of October 28th, 2020. And in the US, uh, we have over 8 million cases and now over 220,000 deaths. This virus sadly has spread around the world. Humans and their domesticated livestock constitute about 96 to 98% of the total global terrestrial mammalian biomass on the planet. There's just not that much wildlife left. And in fact, broiler chickens are a sign of a human reconfigured biosphere. Their combined mass now exceeds all other birds on earth and there's an approximate standing population of almost 23 billion chickens. This study by Berendis and colleagues in Nature Sustainability in 2018 estimated the global recoverable fecal and animal biomass that all seven plus billion humans and almost, and almost 30 billion food animals produce we produce collectively about 4 trillion kilograms of fecal matter, 80% of which is animal fecal matter. Uh, and since 2003, total fecal matter production has been increasing by over 52 kilograms per year. So I did a back of the envelope calculation and estimated that the total fecal matter produced by humans and their livestock in 2014 would fill about 1.6 million Olympic sized swimming pools. And by 2030 uh, would fill about 1.8 million Olympic sized swimming pools of fecal matter each year. So you might ask, well, where does all this fecal matter go? Well, it's often used in agriculture to spread on the fields as fertilizer, but we must ask, well, how much fertilizer is enough and how much is too much? Because if you add too much, well, then you've got rain causing runoff into waterways and all that fecal matter has excess nitrogen and phosphorus causing eutrophication in algae blooms in lakes and coastal waters and that then leads to polluted fish and dead, polluted water and dead fish. And that kit then can lead to environmental fecal contamination, increasing the risk for foodborne and waterborne illnesses. That now leads me to the uh, final topic that I'm gonna talk about and that's antimicrobial resistance because it threatens the practice of modern medicine veterinary medicine and agriculture. The study that I had previously discussed by Berendus Nature Sustainability looked at countries with the highest animal to human fecal ratios. And what stands out is that Australia and New Zealand have some of the highest animal to human fecal ratios in the world. And if you compare that to this study, done by Van Bokel, uh, looking at antibiotic consumption per person, it was always curious why Australia and New Zealand have some of the highest antibiotic consumption per person in the world. And perhaps that might have some relationship 
between the amount of animal to human fecal matter that's in the environment. So that certainly is worthy of study to find out if fecal contamination of the environment makes people sick and then contributes to antibiotic consumption. We are learning more and more about the human microbiomes and we are discovering that the microbes that live in us and on us are as important to our health and well-being as any organ system. Antibiotics adversely impact our microbiomes because they kill the good and the bad microbes, the microbes that are not only causing disease, but the ones that promote our health and well-being. These antibiotics, while they have saved many lives from bacterial infections, then come with a, a, a double-edged sword because not only do they appear to be adversely affecting our microbiomes, but they appear to be adversely affecting the microbiome of the planet, altering the concentration of and the expression of antibiotic resistance genes. And the massive amounts of human and animal fecal matter that are being spread around the environments, contaminating them and disrupting the ecosystems don't help because if they make people sick and more inclined to take more antibiotics, then a vicious cycle develops. So then humans are adversely impact, um, impacting what we call the global microbiome. And they do this through poor sanitation, indiscriminate antibiotic use, widespread human and animal fecal matter being spread on agricultural lands, which then contaminate the land and the water, and the uh, spread of these resistance microbes by wildlife. So antibiotics are the foundation of modern medicine. They are used in humans for both disease prevention and treatment. They're used in livestock. Uh, they had been used for growth that's being curtailed, particularly in Europe and the US. They're also used for prevention and treatment. Antibiotics are used in companion animals, which might also serve as a reservoir for resistant microbes. They're also used in plant agriculture. So all uses of antibiotics can lead to resistance. And as I mentioned earlier, antibiotics kill not only the undesirable bacteria, but they kill the good bacteria as well. And in some ways there's an analogy then between antibiotics and pesticides because you're killing off both the good and the bad indiscriminately. So that leads me to this issue the issue of the study of bacteriophages in the environment. This study was done uh, by uh, John Migalanos and colleagues uh, in ba Bangladesh, looking at why cholera outbreaks <clears throat> were occurring often after monsoons or major storms. They were interested in looking at the microbial ecosystems of the region. And they found when they took samples from the waters in Bangladesh, they found a um, uh, inverse relationship between the vibriophages or the bacteriophages that are targeted against uh, vibrio cholera bacteria and the amount of disease in the populations living in the region. So for example, uh, this is the uh, cholera bacteria, this is the concentration of the phage. And if a storm occurs, the phages get washed out and it allows then the cholera bacteria to skyrocket and you get an outbreak of disease. With time, the equilibrium between the phage and the cholera bacteria would return. You would have a homeostasis between the two and the outbreak would disappear. And so with each storm disrupting the waterways and the equilibrium between, between the phage and the bacteria, you would get disease appear or disease disappear. This is an, an electron micrograph of the vibriophages 
isolated from the waters of Bangladesh. And this is the reference to this study. Again, you would have cases of cholera if the phages were washed away, depending on the different strange, strains of the bacteria and the storm, and there's a seasonality to this. So bacteriophages, one could think of as kind of the green or more sustainable version of treating bacterial infections because antimicrobial resistance is less of a problem with them. Bacteriophages are the natural foes against bacteria. The CRISPR-Cas9 is the bacterial immune system against phages and phages evolved along with the bacteria. Phages are the most prevalent bioform on the planet. And as I said, they might be a very viable strategy against antibiotic resistant bacteria. There are some phage products that have been FDA approved for food safety. Um, there are, however, a number of issues with them. They are highly specific, which has its pluses and minuses because you have to find the right phage to target the bacteria. But on the other hand, there's less of a chance of killing off inadvertently the good bacteria that you don't want to affect. This experience by Dr. Stephanie Strathdy and her husband, Dr. Tom Patterson, um, changed, changed the paradigm on thinking about bacteriophage therapy. They were vacationing in Egypt when Dr. Tom Patterson developed a pan-resistant Acinetobacter baumani infection. He was medevaced back home to UC to San Diego and wound up in the intensive care unit at UC San Diego uh, with, uh, and he was dying from this pan-resistant infection. Dr. Strathdy did was desperate to find a way to cure her husband and stumbled upon bacteriophage therapy. Um, well, to make a long story short, uh, he was given a cocktail of different phages uh, and they uh, cured him from his infection. Um, you can watch Dr. Strathdy talk about this experience in this YouTube TED talk, How Sewage Saved My Husband's Life. And she wrote about the experience in the book, The Perfect Predator. And um, so UC San Diego has since then established a center for innovative phage applications and therapeutics. And there's growing interest now in bacteriophage therapy. So uh, to sum up, we must figure out how to feed ourselves and maintain our civilization without destroying the natural world and unleashing more zoonotic diseases upon ourselves. We have to figure out what to do with all of our wastes so that we don't contaminate our lands and our waters, increasing the risk of us getting sick and needing to take antibacterial therapy. We need to integrate our efforts to benefit humans, animals, environments, and ecosystems. A One Health approach looking at humans, animals and the environment, not just focusing on humans is ab absolutely essential. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and just recognize my colleagues with the One Health Initiative. We are co-founded in 2006. Uh, this is images of the team. Again, please visit our website. And I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions, please send them to me to my email address at elcon at princeton.edu. And thank you and I wish you all a very happy and healthy One Health Day. Awesome, that was a great presentation. I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Um, so now we do have a, a panel uh, each one will speak a bit to um, Dr. Khan's presentation, and then you guys can also ask questions as they come up. And I do see something in the chat already about pulse crops, and that's, that's um, really awesome. 
So, uh, so please, everybody look at that and then hopefully we can chat about that as well. So we have um, Danita Guiri. Danita, I'm going to destroy your last name. So I'm just saying Danita Guiri. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> um, and Adam Wilcox. So Danita is um, is with UTIA, and um, she is. Uh, aren't you associate professor, assistant? Do you still assistant? Say? Okay, assistant professor. I think you've been here for so long. <laughs> um, and she's also a Fulbright scholar to to Ghana, or she has been. So that's pretty awesome too. Um, her area is is that she's going to be um, representing on the panel today is food insecurity. A lot of her work that she does with biodiversity of forests and native plants and such is is related to uh, to food security. We have Adam Wilcox who is. Uh, associate research professor in um, in uh, human dimensions, um, he looks at human dimensions and biodiversity, and he's on uh, and he's in forestry, wildlife, and fisheries. He's on the panel representing. Um, Going to be talking a little bit about bushmeat and and um, the social aspect of that. And we have Marcy Souza, who is uh, the director for veterinary public health at College of Veterinary Medicine, and um, she is going to be, uh, yeah, representing that <laughs> on the uh, panel today and and um, making some comments about the public health aspect. Um, and then. Uh, Dr. David White, who is uh, Associate Dean for Research at um, UTIA, um, University of Tennessee Institute of Ag, and he is going to be representing antimicrobial resistance because that is where a lot of, uh, he's done a lot of work and he's going to be talking about the National Action Plan to combat antibiotic resistance. So I'm going to let you guys first, if you would just take um, a few minutes to address some of the comments as you would like or comment on the presentation and emphasize some of the important aspects. Um, and then uh, we'll take questions as well. And whoever would like to talk first, you can do them in the order I just said, because it kind of follows the order of the presentation. So Danita, if you want to go first. Sure. It's really interesting. Um, so the work I've done in, in uh, Ghana uh, and West Africa is associated with food security. And I work with two different plants there uh, that have a high potential of um, meeting those needs. So one is called Fra Fra Potato, and that's actually what was funded by the Fulbright. And the other plant is uh, an anti-malarial plant that is used for um, treating malaria. So both plants are native and indigenous and fra, fra potato is actually not a potato, it's in a mint family, um, but it's used by indigenous people and uh, it's used as a crop that can be grown by uh, women and children, so it's easier to harvest. Um, and they use, use it as a porridge, but also it's a very small tuber and it's a really huge problem in West Africa in general, issues with post-harvest um, diseases. So my job there was to uh, assess genetic diversity of these two different plants. Uh, and the other one is the, the, they use the root system to boil and uh, treat malaria because that's a really big problem uh, for that part of the world. They're both native and one is actually anti-malarial plant is endangered. And this is part of the problem with pharmaceutical companies. Um, because it's used as anti-malarial treatment, the plants are completely, uh, and the root system is needed so they harvested and yanked under, out of the, um, the soil and, and the plants are being completely disseminated. So these are really two simple and good examples that could be used by um, using the native species, preserving biodiversity. So a lot of things that was discussed in the talk um, that are important to um, one health concept in general from the plant side of the equation and also provide uh, food uh, for people that usually would not be able to obtain um, in any other way or they can grow that by themselves or that can be what they call transitioning crop, a uh, crop between a uh, large uh, production seasons that can uh, basically tie the family together. Uh, another aspect of, um, for instance, fra fra potato, I'm going back and forth between the two, is it is extremely well adapted to climate change. So it grows in conditions that I didn't think anything can grow, number one. It's extremely dry. Uh, it does not need a lot of um, 
tending. Uh, it grows in very poor um, soils. And that part of the world is obviously um, having huge issues with climate change. So all these concepts are interconnected as a one health approach. And I think uh, as researchers at UT, we can provide some of the answers and these collaborations are very meaningful. I actually have a currently PhD student who is working on fra fra potato uh, uh, genetics and genomics. And we just actually received a mini grant uh, to answer some of these questions. So this is our connection. Uh, we can provide uh, not only food security options, but we can also train some of their um, uh, do capacity building for West African countries. So these students can go back, train uh, additional people in uh, new techniques and technologies, um, provide uh, the knowledge that they gain here, uh, and also teach us about certain things that we are not aware of. So um, there is a big circle of, of connectivity between all of us, and One Health is, is a big connection with all of that. You muted. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Adam, you want to um, chat a bit about um, bushmeat and maybe um, talking about, uh, she made some comments about um, eating meat in general. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about bushmeat. I mean, I've, I've been in, involved in bushmeat one way or another through my entire career. You can see I changed my background. That's for me when I was probably 23, 24 years old, working for the Wildlife Conservation Society in Cameroon. Uh, we're holding, me and my hunting assistant here, holding up a, a an African dwarf crocodile, um, an endangered species that was in the bushmeat market. Um, I'm going to encourage everyone to, first of all, to listen in at 12.30. Uh, Marcy, Maya, and Rick, and uh, uh, Chica's student, Bree Dell, will be talking about our most recent work in Uganda related to bushmeat, which is it's gotten a little bit of press and been picked up by some food safety folks. Evidently, Dave White sent me a thing today that the, the article was picked up by a prominent food safety um, web resource. But the one thing I missed in the um, presentation, I actually, you know, I know, I know quite a bit about bushmeat, but there's one thing I think we're missing here when it comes to relating food security and entering into um, our expansion of agriculture. I think that's actually probably as important, if not more important than, than bushmeat and bushmeat consumption. Our population is, is rising, right? And if we're not going to address that one way or another, um, we're going to need to feed people more sustainably. Currently, agriculture remains the number one reason why we're losing biodiversity across the globe. It's been like that forever, guys. We know this. And in addition to losing this biodiversity by us expanding our agriculture into natural areas, we're just infinitely increasing human-wildlife interactions. All right, these Ebola are outbreaks, it's people have been tracing these not necessarily to the bushmeat trade, but to um, children or others in areas where bats have roosted. Right, so we're picking up transmission of diseases that way, not necessarily from the bushmeat trade. It is a very important avenue um, for and something for us to talk about. But we need to be addressing also food security uh, by feeding ourselves sustainably. If we can't sustain, if we can't intensify our production or um, make it more uh, efficient, I think we're 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 in a lot of trouble here because these human wildlife interactions are just going to exponentially increase, and it's not necessarily from farmers or from hunters, from bushmeat hunters and bushmeat consumers all the time. It's just from regular farmers trying to carve out their existence on the land. Um, when it comes to bushmeat, I got into this, like I said, here in this picture, I was with the Wildlife Conservation Society, so really got into it from a from a biodiversity <clears throat> conservation perspective. Uh, I was working on sustainability of hunting for quite quite some time rather than, than One Health uh, issues or issues related to zoonoses. Uh, but as I got, um, I, I lived in communities that were reliant, totally reliant on bushmeat. I lived in this, uh, these communities in Cameroon for six years. I had to eat bushmeat to survive. That's all that was available at the local level. So we need to be thinking about a holistic approach, which One Health thankfully provides, right? So the, the social implications of eating meat, the, the, the issues of poverty and um, electrific electrification. I was in areas that had no electricity, uh, so we had no refrigeration, very poor transport networks. This is all contributing to, to One Health. And this does sound daunting and like a wicked problem. It is a wicked problem. It is a very big problem. But it's one that hopefully we can address in our One Health. But I want to stress here to our One Health group, I keep seeing a lot of, okay, you know, how this affects us in Tennessee. Um, well, this does affect us in Tennessee. Okay, so this is a global issue. And I, I hope that as UT progresses forward on the UT One Health Initiative that we uh, continue to recognize the regional and global effects of this and not just concentrate on 
responding to viruses and, and other things that pop up and hit us here um, and just responding with a purely a, a healthcare approach or a medicine approach. That's all I got. Thanks, Brooke, Deb. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. That's awesome. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions because um, I'm, I'm thinking of questions for each of you as we go. <laughs> all right. Marcy, you want to go next? Sure. So I'll, I'll jump a little bit off what Adam was mentioning. And, and we're not going to go too much into this because, as he said, um, Dr. Bree Dell will be giving one of the talks a little bit later about the project that we worked on. Uh, but just kind of when the, that project started, it was initially something that we were looking at as a conservation of wildlife issue. And then it had all these fingers into the social implications, as well as, you know, what are the public health risks associated with the bushmeat trade? Um, and so that's a lot of what Bree's dissertation looked at. Um, I think, you know, I think making a jump from one health to public health is pretty easy in most people's eyes, uh, particularly right now. Um, I think that if we look at the destruction of ecosystems and pulling those wildlife out of those habitats, um, encroaching on those areas, whether it be for increased agriculture, um, but we're coming in contact with these, these species that we typically don't have contact with. And um, as it mentioned in the, the lecture from Dr. Khan, you know, this, this isn't like it came out of left field. People knew this was going to happen. Um, and it takes, um, it takes thought and, um, you know, looking forward and trusting our scientists to actually, you know, plan for things like this. Um, and so, you know, I've already mentioned that I've worked with the bushmeat stuff. Um, something that I've, over the last few years that I've gotten really interested in um, is how to translate science into policy and to make it actually something that's useful. And so you look at a lot of politicians um, currently that are out there um, and there's a disregard for a lot of science. And, you know, it's probably partly our, our fault um, that we're, we're not always willing to engage. We're not always willing to look at science and say, okay, well, what does this mean for the average person? How do we actually make this something that can actually be used? Um, and so that's part of, you know, what's coming out of uh, Bree's dissertation is how do we take that back to Uganda and make recommendations of here's, here's something that you could think about doing. Um, and so that's something that I've really been focusing on with um, students in my various classes. Um, and, you know, we have a wildlife disease class that um, we've been, their midterm every year is that they have to write a policy brief. And so when you first introduce it to the students, they go, oh, policy, bleh, and they hate it. But then as they, I work through um, basically a particular issue that has to do with wildlife. And as we work through the problem, they, they realize, oh, I, I have to be the expert. Like as we go forward, we have to all step forward and be willing to be that voice, um, whether it's for local issues or global issues. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, I guess I kind of see where we as academicians can play a role is, um, you know, serving as a, as a voice for our community, whether it's at a local level or um, national or international, because um, as we all see that most people that run for office are, are not trained in science. Um, they don't necessarily understand that. And I think that that's really important, not only for conservation, as we already mentioned, but for food security and protecting the health of, um, you know, humans, as we can see the, the mess that we're in right now um, because of a lack of food security in rural China and that international trade that can um, either transplant animals or with air, tra air travel, we can go all over the place except for right now, all of us are grounded. <laughs> so um, I think that's kind of all my thoughts is just kind of the, you know, thinking about the bigger picture of how do we actually take the science that we're doing and actually making it apply to real world problems. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, Marcy. That was great. Um, okay, so Dr. White, tell us about the national, tell us about antimicrobial resistance. <laughs> Uh, sure. Uh, do, you, do you have eight hours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, antimicrobial resistance has been a—it's been kind of my whole research background for the past 20 years. Where I was—I moved from the bench into policy when I was in the federal government, and trying to keep it moving forward to insert academia into um, the expertise needed by the federal government to look at implementation of actions. But in terms of um, the overall Dr. Khan's presentation, which I really enjoyed, you know, antimicrobial resistance is a great example where a global One Health approach needs to be developed and implemented 
to achieve optimal health for animals, people, and the environment. It is a classic One Health paradigm, antibiotic resistance. You really can't, because everything that happens, you squeeze a balloon. When something happens here, something else happens here. You know, regardless of using antimicrobials in the environment, believe it or not, there's a lot of antimicrobials used in plants, plant protection, animals, obviously animal husbandry, uh, infectious disease control, and then people. And then also you have the manufacturer of these antimicrobials in facilities where sometimes the wastewater is dumped into the environment and it's leftover antimicrobial that selects for incredibly amounts of resistant bacteria and resistance genes in the environment. And they eventually will find their way into a pathogen. Um, so what's happening? In worldwide, there's so many things happening. Each country has their own plan. Most of them, the developed nations have that. The World Health Organization is coordinating that. For human plans, uh, the Office of International Epizootics, which is the World Organization of Animal Health, is doing that with animals. And in the United States, we've been doing this probably for 10 years. This, I was involved when I was at FDA, leading an interagency task force on antimicrobial resistance because so many different federal agencies have a part of it. And I think you all know how great the federal government does in coordinating across. Uh, it, it can be improved upon. So what happened is uh, last month, uh, the second national action plan to combat antibiotic resistant bacteria was released. Uh, this is a, a huge endeavor, and it was built on the initial one from five years ago. And this, uh, something called the CARB, C-A-R-B, which is Combating uh, Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria. And it's co-chaired by the U.S. Health and Human Services, the United States Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Defense. And they come together to kind of coordinate federal activities in five main areas. And the five main goals uh, right now are slow emergence of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, second, a big call out, strengthen One Health surveillance. That is a call out in the National Action Plan to, to strengthen One Health surveillance and link all together, people, animals, and the environment. Also want to advance innovative diagnostics for detection, accelerate research and development into new antimicrobial alternatives, new therapeutics, immune modulators, Right? There needs to be a market incentive for people to go out and develop things because the cost of R&D for new antimicrobials is astronomical. And the FDA regulations, unfortunately, which you're seeing with the vaccines um, with uh, COVID, you know, they take some time. There's a lot of evaluation that goes into that. And sometimes pharmaceutical companies, right, they're not doing it because they're altruistic. They have uh, shareholders. They expect to make money. Uh, so it takes some time. And then the last one is improve international collaborations. So again, we can't do this in a vacuum. We have to do this in a coordinated fashion uh, across the globe in preventing antimicrobial resistance from becoming something that we return to a pre-antibiotic era. Uh, and unfortunately, I think what Dr. Khan mentioned, antibiotics, there's something called the antibiotic paradox. As soon as you use it and you open up the bottle, the genie is out and you select for resistance that actually will sell the demise of that product over time. So it's a really interesting area. For those of you that are, are interested in, a, in a, a great research area, antibiotic resistance is one to go in, but it's a classic One Health. And uh, to support the One Health um, aspect of that, of the National Action Plan, uh, something was created called the PAC CARB, P-A-C-C-A-R-B. And that's the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria. And uh, this, this is made up of 15 um, voting members from different disciplines. I was appointed last year to this to represent um, veterinary medicine, food safety. Uh, it has experts from both human animal health domains as well as academia and industry. And we all work together. And believe it or not, One Health is emphasized and utilized for all activities. So it's been a great experience. Uh, unfortunately, all of our meetings this past year have been virtual. And our next one will probably be in January virtual as well. But uh, we're trying to move forward to implement implementing these five priorities and there's a lot to coordinate. So it's an exciting time. And One Health is uh, you know, heavily um, cited in, in our efforts. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, that was good. I uh, wanna open it up to questions. So, since we just started with the uh, ended with the antimicrobial resistance, where um, so 
we know that there's a lot of data and we don't know what it means, but um, that we're finding antimicrobial resistant pathogens even from marine life out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so when we look, when we consider that, is there, it, that seems to me that it has really far reaching effects and, it, and it's amazing to me that that can even be possible. But what are your thoughts on, um, on just the extent of this problem, given that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the greatest global challenges we face outside of pandemic. Frankly, uh, antimicrobial resistance has made many pathogens um, incredibly deadly. They're not necessarily a virulence factor, but they prevent therapeutic treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some bacteria out there that have almost resistant to every single drug approved um, for use. And, and uh, there was this one drug called colistin, which is a very nasty toxic antimicrobial that was being used for some bacteria uh, the, they call them KPCs, um, Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, carbapenemase uh, resistant bacteria. A lot of these resistant bacteria infections in the hospital, when you get them and they're multi-drug resistant, your outlook is bleak. You know, especially if you're older, you have a, a compromised immune system, there's a really good chance you're going to die. Uh, so we desperately need new antibiotics that are quick and they're specific in their target because a lot of times what happens too, a lot of these powerful antimicrobials have broad impacts on your microbiome. So it's just not killing the pathogen, it's wiping out your, your normal flora, mm -hmm. uh, which makes you susceptible to other things. So uh, there's that balance of, of selective, you want a scalpel that can go in and kill the pathogen without disrupting your microbial flora. And there's a lot of uh, research in those. I think we're seeing a lot of startup biotechs. We're seeing CRISPR-Cas come in, some genomic ideas for this. So it's gonna be an exciting time, I hope. But there are a lot of regulations that people need to know about, especially these startup companies from academia that don't have a, a consumer regulatory group because FDA is humongous. And the amount of regs you have to go through to get something approved, you need attorneys. There is no doubt. So there's got to be partnerships that we can put people in touch with and advocacy groups to help. Uh, so, so yeah, hopefully I kind of answered that, Deb. It's, it's tremendous. And it depends on the pathogen, too. Right. There are some pathogens that are still susceptible to antimicrobials, and we've been using them for 50 years. Others, though, like, you know, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, you know, slowly accumulating resistances that to almost every single drug we have. So stewardship comes back in. You see a lot of antimicrobial stewardship programs in both medicine and in veterinary medicine. A lot of vet hospitals now have stewardship programs to monitor which antimicrobials are being used in addition to surveillance of the resistance profile of the pathogens. So they can kind of compare and contrast what's happening with use and selection pressure and outcomes. Thank you. That was very good. So, so a theme uh, across what Laura was talking about, but also across each of the, the wonderful panelists' responses that, I, that jumps out at me is very much this idea of sustainable utilization and whether or not that's sustainable by management because it's self-defeating in the way that, that using antibiotics leading to instant selection against, uh, uh, against uh, their efficacy or over-harvesting for some of the, the drugs being used against malaria or, um, or sustainable uh, bushmeat as an integral uh, part of, um, of a, a diet um, in a way that maintains uh, both cultural and economic stability. Um, and then even sustainability of communication and some of the things that, that Marcy was saying about, about how we develop changing our minds as scientists, but also communicating this. So I was wondering if I could ask maybe each of the panelists very quickly to talk about their insights on how, on how the perspectives of sustainable practice, not just in their research, but also in the in the meta research around how to how to do their field, um, might be a useful thing for us to think about today. Well, I can jump real quick, Nina. So, in terms of antimicrobial resistance, you know what? Ev almost every single professional organization that uh, is in the medical or veterinary field, or even the environment, has come up with antimicrobial stewardship guidelines which they push out to their members. 
Uh, now, there's no follow-up to that. You know, you put it out there and you expect people to use them, but there's never been an evaluation of how effective those guidelines are in terms of, you know, your behavior. I think, and then too, if you have a patient dying, your stewardship guidelines go out the window, right? Because you're like, okay, I understand that. I got to save this person and I'm going to go with this and not really think about whatever the, the, the clinician is telling me in terms of susceptibility. So outreach is huge, even to uh, consumers. Right, I mean, there, there was been a big uh, push in pediatrics in particular because there was a lot of heavy duty antimicrobial use for ear infections that were ne never needed. And, and, and mom and dads would go in there expecting an antimicrobial and uh, when a physician would not give it to them, you know, raise holy help. So there's been an education campaign, uh, campaign against that saying most of these infections are viral, antimicrobial is not going to work, No, when an antimicrobial is needed. Uh, we need to start probably young, school, you know, uh, K to 12, understanding what an antimicrobial is, why you need to take it, when not to take it. And then people, the other thing too, there's all these campaigns you need because people don't finish their, their course. Yeah, right. That's a big thing. Antimicrobials, when you get a antimicrobial therapy, it's, it's for, you know, two, three times a day for a week. People stop after they start feeling better. Well, you, you've, what you've done is you've lowered the microbial load to your immune system can you know, help again with eradicate that, but you probably have maybe selected for resistance. And then people, next time they feel sick, they go to what's left over. Uh, it's a recipe for um, resistance uh, bacteria. So it's a real problem. And education has got to be a big component of it. So I'll jump off that and kind of build on the education ideas that, so um, I'm sure that at least some folks on this call realize, but um, we're in the process of having a One Health minor for both undergraduates as well as graduates. Um, the idea behind that, really kind of going back to what I was saying, is that if, if you are knowledgeable, whether your field is um, math modeling, Nina, or if it's, um, you know, sociology or policy or whatever it happens to be, um, that the, the minor is going to try and get people on a page that looks at some of those skills that really cross disciplines. And so that's looking at things like leadership skills, um, communication skills, um, how to translate your area into science, or sorry, into policy or programs. Um, and so I think it really kind of, in order for it to be sustainable, that's something that needs to cross all disciplines, um, that we get our students on board with, you know what, I'm not a politician, but I do remember writing that one policy brief, so I at least kind of know the language, um, so that you've got this long-term push of people that are engaged in um, taking those steps to improve, you know, whatever problems are facing them. All right, Nina, I'll talk a, a second about sustainability. I'll move it from bushmeat to more to hunting. <clears throat> okay, so the broader perspective of hunting. Uh, we can manage wildlife and hunting sustainably, but, but we've done it in a way how that developed, as, as I'm sure most of you know, in the U.S. we, we started that by monitoring, uh, by regulating trade, the Lacey Act came in and we couldn't trade species, we couldn't trade wildlife across state borders. This was seconded by law enforcement and hunting limits and regulations and bag limits, all that. Well, we've tried to apply this trade model or this heavy top-down model across the world in places that do not have the resources. Okay, so now we're regulating wildlife trade by only regulating endangered species. We're regulating through the CITES, the Convention on the Inter International Trade in Endangered Species of Flora and Fauna. Well, not all our zoonoses are coming from endangered species. So there's a hole right there when it comes to sustainability and we're talking about One Health. You look at this picture I'm here, there is no law, there's one, there would be what the equivalent of one game officer for, uh, I can't remember how big this wildlife sanctuary was, I was working around, but it was big. Uh, so this model of um, Western sustainability of hunting or bushmeat is not really, um, cannot be applied all that well in all, all around the world. So we need to be very context specific and respectful of local institutions. That includes there's local harvest institutions as well to strengthen those local institutions so that people can begin to take ownership of uh, natural resources, whether that's agricultural resources or wildlife resources or anything along those lines, um, recognizing just as Eleanor Ostrom has, has done in, throughout her career in, um, looking at local uh, grassroots management of systems. Um, we need to really take that very seriously and not just sit here, especially after a, a COVID event and saying we're going to ban all 
bush meat market. So we're going to ban all this and ban all that. It's just not practical or feasible. So let's take our head out of the sand and take our Western glasses off for a while and realize that law enforcement and policy at the international level is not going to take us to where we need to go. So we need to be a lot more flexible and, and understand our context and our, on our real partners in the world, which could be this farm, this hunter right here in a small rural community in Southwest Cameroon. So from the food security perspective, it's a very similar story, how you can make this sustainable. So I'll use example of uh, anti-malarial plant, uh, Cryptolepis. So since farmers, this plant is grown in wild, it's not cultivated. So, and I have to look at things from a short term and then long term approach as well. Um, so for the short, short term, it's what is in for the farmer or grower or family in Ghana that needs to go, not just Ghana, but Western Africa and similar stories here uh, with certain plants that we work with, um, the idea is the same. So they have to go and collect these because the price for pound or two or bushel is much higher, three, four, five times higher than it was a few years ago because pharmaceutical companies are uh, wanting this ingredient because it is used in, in homeopathic um, medication across Western Africa. So now they're going deeper um, into the wild to get these plants. Uh, they're harvesting, they're over harvesting. So one of the ways that we're approaching this, so what is the immediate thing? They do not care necessarily about um, genome um, sequencing of the cryptolepis plant. That is a long term that we can do something about it. But right now they're interested in what can I do about it? So one of the ways we can help and the collaborator that I'm working with in, in Ghana, she's actually trying to commercialize this plant to see which way she can produce this on a large commercial scale because there is actually, you can find this ingredient on Amazon for $50. <laughs> And uh, it is supposedly treating Lyme disease as well. So there is a producer here that's actually purchasing um, some of the ingredients from Ghanaian farmers. So they're trying to connect these two options of, of economic value for somebody who can commercialize that here, but things can be purchased in Ghana from the Ghanaian farmers. So how can we mitigate that and put that into a package that works for everybody? from the fra, fra potato perspective. And again, these are just only two plants and there are a number of plants and uh, groups in West Africa that identify these species that are climate change friendly. From the fra, fra potato perspective, it's not only that it grows in great conditions, but it's also like really highly nutrient um, efficient with macro and micronutrients. So it has a high concentration of iron as well. So, and also it's gluten free. So now we have a huge market in the United States for gluten, not just the United States, but worldwide, where you can sell this at a much higher price. So create some flowers. And these are, and again, the researchers in Ghana are working on this, on trying to commercialize this. So these are like short-term effective solutions that can help farmers in um, three, five, 10 years. But the long-term is where we come in also, where we can sequence genome and, and look for resistance in, in, um, to certain pathogens and, and genes and all sorts of other things that a farmer is not necessarily interested, but it can create certain varieties that are bigger and larger and the tubers are more um, portable and uh, less uh, disease susceptible and so on and so forth. So thinking of that almost like a two, five, 10, 20 year plan is a way to keep this sustainable. Thanks. And with that, um, right on time, we'll end our panel discussion.